it up one or two. And there we are. This is our planet, Earth, as visualized from space using uh, one of those excellent Raven Company maps. And as you can see, the planet is round because it's held together by gravity. And the planet is composed of various elements. Uh, some of those elements are lightweight, like oxygen and hydrogen. Some of the other elements are heavy, like iron or uranium. And so gravity holds all of these elements together towards the center of the Earth. And because gravity is strong, the denser, heavier elements are held more towards the center of the planet, while the lighter elements form the, a membrane around the edge of the planet. The lightest membrane, we're in. The atmosphere, oxygen, nitrogen, very lightweight. Uh, a second thing that covers the surface of the Earth that's relatively lightweight is the oceans. Water is heavier than air, but water's lighter than the rocks that comprise our planet, and so the water forms another surface cover of our planet. And then the third area of lightweight things that covers the surface is the continents. We think of the continents as being made out of rock, and rock is heavy, and that's right. Compared to water, compared to air, rock is heavy. But the rock that the continents are made out of is rock that's heavy, but it's lighter than the other rocks below it, and so the continents are floating on the surface of our planet. And if we <coughs> dig down deep enough in any continent, and the continents are typically 20 to 30 miles thick, and sometimes a little thicker at mountain range areas, but they're not very thick compared to the 7,000 mile diameter of the planet. The continents are almost all granite or granite-like rocks when you get deep down, even though we have other rocks on the surface. And granite can come in different varieties. Sometimes it's pink, sometimes it's a little blacker, sometimes it's gray, and in geological terms, there are specific names for these that aren't always simply granite, but we can colloquially call them all granites. And the different types of granite are kind of like the different brands of granola cereals. <laughs> Some granolas have more wheat in them, or oats. Others have more hazelnuts, but they're all granolas. <laughs> well, the same with the different types of granite. And the granites, these rocks that comprise the under part of our continent, are floating on denser rocks below them that are heavier in iron and therefore are denser. And so we could think of the continents as being like rafts of granite that are floating on the surface of our planet, something like the way that an ice flow floats on the surface of the Connecticut River during the wintertime. The ice is only about 10% lighter than the water it floats on, but that's enough to make it buoyant. And as the water currents move around, the rafts of ice hitch a ride on those water currents and sometimes bump into each other. The continents are not themselves floating on something that's liquid, the way this ice is floating on the ice of the water of the Connecticut River. The continents are floating on something solid, but those solid heavier rocks that the continents are riding on do slowly move around with currents that are driven by naturally occurring radioactive decay within the planet. So the heat of that radioactive decay drives convection currents that propel the iron-rich rocks below the continents to move around just the way, or much the way, that as the water on the Connecticut River moves around in the wintertime, these rafts of ice that float on top hitch a ride. And when these rafts of ice run into each other, they create pressure ridges right along the edges of the ice flows. Something similar happens to the continents. The edges of the continents are more likely to be bumping into other things, <coughs> and as they do so, they crunch and fold, not too unlike those ice flows. For the last 200 million years, North America has been moving roughly westward. And as it's done so, it's done a lot of bumping into things, a lot of crunching, and so we have the relatively recent mountains of the Rocky Mountains and the Sierra Nevadas and the Cascades that have happened in the western part of the continent over the last 200 million years. If we go back in time, 
to between 250 and 450 million years ago. At that time, our continent was not moving westward. It was moving relatively eastward. And so we got the Appalachian Mountains, which once upon a time were a lot taller, but have eroded down. Here you can see them. And if you look at these southern Appalachians, I think intuitively you can sort of sense from the map, if you, maybe you can see it, that it sort of looks like somebody slid a rug across a floor and these things all folded over on each other. Well, yeah, intuitively that's pretty much what happened there. So, oh, and up here in New England we have rocks that are, the mountains that are a bit older than the southern Appalachians. If we go back to 450 million years ago, North America was down where South America is today. And so Vermont would have been about where Rio de Janeiro is now. And if we'd been in, let's say, Manchester, Vermont, 450 million years ago, or where Manchester is today, it would have looked something like this. <laughs> well, let's see. There are some parts that weren't. They, they didn't have swimming pools. <laughs> they didn't have people. They didn't have condos 450 million years ago. They didn't even have palm trees. So what part of this picture is like what Western Vermont, Manchester, was like 450 million years ago? This upper right corner. 450 million years ago, Western Vermont was a snorkeler's paradise. It would have been like the Bahamas or like Miami. Um, and you could have gone snorkeling. There would have been creatures that you would recognize, some of them anyway, as being very similar to what we have today. These are brachiopods. Brachiopods still exist today, though they're not very common. So um, it's not exactly the same species, but you, it looks recognizably like a seashell. There were things like trilobites, which have gone completely extinct. But if we'd been snorkeling, we would have seen creatures um, that would have looked like a sort of crazy aquarium. Year after year after year, um, there would be storms or natural deposition of what's called calcium carbonate, which is the material of seashells, the material of <coughs> coral. And calcium carbonate is something that also naturally precipitates out of water when it's warm. So you get layer upon layer upon layer, year after year, like the pages of a book laid down in western Vermont. And then, just as we were getting used to being in a tropical paradise, came the first interruption here. Okay. All right. So, what do we have here? Okay. These pillows here, the white pillows, these represent Manchester, Vermont, and the coral reefs. It's very shallow water here. You need cor the wo coral reefs can't make it unless the water is 60 feet deep or less. So it has to be nice and shallow. And then offshore, there was deep ocean mud, okay? And everything was going fine. You could have snorkeled and everything was great. And then <laughs> came the first collision of a series of three collisions that were going to happen. This is an offshore volcanic island chain that came from the east and pushed these deep ocean muds, which were at this point deep ocean mud that had turned to rock, pushed the rock that originated as deep ocean mud up on top of the shallow water tropical marine environment. So what you got was rocks that had originated thousands of feet underwater ending up on top of rocks that had originated 50 feet underwater. And that created the Taconic Mountains. 450 million years ago. Here you can see what happened. Folding was going on. Rocks that were clearly laid down horizontally originally were uplifted and uh, folded, tilted like that. And this is Equinox Mountain right here. Equinox <coughs> is one of the Taconic Mountains. And this is on Route 7 looking west. The village of Manchester is way over here. I'm going to move. Can we hold, hold those rocks? Okay, we'll need it. Yeah, you can hold them. I know they're. Thank you. Okay. So, this is the village of Manchester, is here. This is Equinox Mountain. 
And as with most of our New England mountains, if you go high enough, you get into spruces and firs. And if you get lower, lower you don't find any spruces and firs. That's not unusual. But what's different about T the Taconic Mountains and Equinox Mountain is that the, div the dividing line between spruces and firs above, which do fine in acid soils, and sugar maples and white ashes down below that want a soil that's very close to neutral, <coughs> follows the bedrock line perfectly. Let me see these here between the lower part of Equinox Mountain, which is rock that originated as corals and limestones and marble, and then the upper part, which is schist. Okay, and so this is the bedrock line, dividing line. Above here is the rock that originated as deep ocean mud. Below is the rock that originated as tropical marine snorkeling paradise. <laughs> so if you take limestone, which is basically the same material as seashells and coral, and you cook and compress limestone, you'll get the rock called marble. So that's one thing that can happen to these things that started out as snorkelers paradise. And another thing that can happen to rocks that started out as snor snorkelers paradise in the Taconic Mountains of Western New England is that Mount Greylock in Massachusetts is also a Taconic and has the same <coughs> basic structure as um, Equinox Mountain. Only something is happening at Greylock Mountain that's not happening in Equinox. And what is it? Tums. <laughs> that's where they get their tums from. When you are having an acid stomach because you're stuck in traffic, even if you're in Los Angeles or if you're in Dallas or Atlanta or New York City, you're popping a Tums. You are eating a little bit of what had been snorkeling type rock <laughs> 450 million years ago. And of course, you have no idea that you're doing this. But so things can erode for a lot of reasons in geology. You get rainfall bringing things down. Ice will erode things. Wind can erode things. But I haven't seen it in a textbook yet that the high-tech stress of our modern society can erode the base of a taconic mountain <laughs> in Western Mass. But you go to the base of Mount Greylock, and you can see they're mining it away. Every time somebody stuck in traffic is popping a Tums anywhere in the world, <laughs> on their behalf, these mine workers are chewing away at, at Mount Greylock. <laughs> OK, so how the mighty fo are fallen. The Taconics, of course, were tall mountains for a while. And what happens to tall mountains? Well, they erode. And so out into the ocean to the east went some sand deposits. <laughs> we, have, we have a little bit of maybe some mud is going down there. Then we have some limey mud. Lots of that coming down off that coral <laughs> rock. <laughs> Then, then maybe even a little volcanic activity at some point. OK. So off to the east of the Taconic Mountains, out in the deep ocean, we have these layers of material that are buried, that have buried my controller. <laughs> and now I need an audience volunteer. I need somebody who, who wants to impersonate a microcontinent called Avalonia. <laughs> Who would like to be Avalonia? Would you like to be Avalonia? Yes. Come right up. <laughs> All right. You are a microcontinent, okay? And a microcontinent today would be like the two islands of New Zealand would be a microcontinent. Okay, they're floating out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Well, a microcontinent came floating from the east across our ocean. And your job as the microcontinent called Avalonia is to push these deep ocean sediments up against the Taconic Mountains. So just start pushing. Just keep going. You can go faster. I know this was, took millions of years in real life, but we'll speed it up. <laughs> you can come even faster. Just keep coming. You can go quicker. <laughs> just keep, look at that. You're folding it. That's it. Perfect. Excellent. And you, although in real life you'd have to stay there for the next 400 million years, you can go back and sit down now. Thank you. Wasn't that great? That was Avalonia. And Avalonia today in New England would be eastern Massachusetts, east of Interstate 495, the state of Rhode Island. There's also some Avalonia in the uh, maritime provinces of Canada. And parts of Great Britain are also Avalonia. 
And what they did, what Avalonia did when it rammed into us, is it took those deep ocean sediments and it folded them. See how folded they got? They got crunched. So this is the core of the Southern Green Mountains. The Taconics are way over there. Here's the Connecticut River, right where it is today. It got squished. Here we'll see another cross section. This is a, about where Chester is. And look at these rocks that have folded up and over and upside down again. It's like a wave of rock that broke. This is what happened 400 million years ago when Avalonia ran into us and took these deep ocean sediments that had started out as flat on the bottom and folded them. So some of them became vertical. Look at that. That's a road cut in um, Springfield. Um, and these two layers of rock, this gray green one and the black one, were originally laid down flat. But they were folded so much that they're now vertical. I think geologists are, there's probably more than one um, interpretation that geologists have come up with on some of these <coughs> things, or at least the competing interpretations. Because if you look at the chaos that was created by Avalonia here, it can sometimes, you can come up with different plausible interpretations. So that's a good question. I once asked a professor of geology at UMass, and he said, well, we really don't know. So. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, <coughs> all up and down Interstate 91, you see this lustrous rock. This is called phyllite. Um, phyllite originated as um, deep ocean clay, okay? But when you take that deep ocean clay and you compress it and cook it, it mica forms, okay? And it's the mica in that makes the phyllite shine like that. And uh, if you look at it, it kind of looks like the dull side of Reynolds rack. Doesn't it? Well, it's got a lot of aluminum in it. That's why. And so if you, I'm going to fix the focus there. If you, there we go. If you cook clay far enough and compress it far enough, well, first you'll get shale. But if you go far enough, you'll get phyllite. And if you go from phyllite and cook it a little more, you start to get these little bumps called garnets, OK? <laughs> these cranberry colored. Uh, minerals, and so a geologist can look at one of these rocks and see which minerals have formed, and from that he can deduce the thermal history of the rock. And you and I could do this on our own at home with a piece of bread. If you take a piece of bread and it's white, you know the bread has not been cooked. If you, if you cook it a little bit in the toaster, it gets light brown. If you see it's darker brown, you can figure out, ah, it was in the toaster just right. And if it's completely charcoal, you can tell it was in the toaster longer, too long. Well, geologists can do the same thing with these rocks. So when they see garnets, they know it was cooked more than just to mica, <coughs> OK? And so a lot of our rocks have been cooked. Uh, some of them haven't been cooked as much to be, have garnets, and some have. So this is a bedrock map here of east, southeastern Vermont. And let's see, this is Black Mountain right here. So Brattleboro's down here. Vernon's a little bit to the south. Um, Putney's here. <coughs> Bellows Falls is there. There's Mount Escutney. And you'll notice that New Hampshire is completely excluded. <laughs> That's what happens when you pay lower taxes. <laughs> 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 you don't get anything. <laughs> All right. And I think you can see from these, each of these different colors is a different type of bedrock. And you can, I think, intuitively sort of feel, boy, these things sort of feel like they're swirling around, almost like, you know, fudge ripple ice cream, only they're all solid rock. But at one point, when they were deep enough down, they were plastic and could fold. And here, they've actually folded up and over each other. Here, there's another up overturned fold down in Guilford. And so these different colors represent different types of rock. So this green color over here, this is the town of Putney. So Dummerston's right down below. And basically, the rocks continue pretty much into Dummerston. So you're, when you're seeing Putney, you're seeing a lot of what is the same in Dummerston. The easternmost part of but, uh, Putney has acid bedrock, which is actually, by geologists, considered to be of New Hampshire affinity because it was further out to sea during the time when all these rocks were formed. And so it got um, 
muds that formed and clays that formed that didn't have the benefit of underwater landslides bringing Tums material down into the sea as happened further to the west where you've got rock here that's loaded with Tums material, calcium carbonate. This is Westminster West, Putney, like this. And then further to the west, you've got, you have a ridge of quartzite, the Putney Mountain Ridge, or it has a lot of quartzite, which originated as sand. So this was limey mud, this was acid mud, this was more sandy in its origin. And if we look at the vegetation today in these communities, they line up with the bedrock. If we look to the far right of this picture, which is a false color picture in which conifers are shown, that is to say pine trees, are shown as dark red. The deciduous trees are shown as gray green. Where you have fields, it's this sort of lighter color. And you can see way over here in the eastern part of Putney, there's lots of conifers. That's because the bedrock is the green colored acid bedrock. In the center of the map, we have this zone of rock that has lots of the Tums material in it, it makes a really excellent soil. And so um, that zone has lots of fields and farms. And then if we go further, we get to, to the quartzite of Putney Mountain and the, the ridge of Windmill Hill in Westminster West. So if we were looking at the acid bedrock, this is a picture over in New Hampshire. Um, what it doesn't contain is a lot of the Tums material, the impure marbles and limestones. And so the trees that grow there from the soils that are made from these, this bedrock are going to be acid-loving species. Lots of hemlocks. Um, where you go over here into this zone that has the really rich soil because the bedrock originated clo closer to the shoreline of Vermont originally, you, f you find a lot of this crumbly rock that you'll see in um, uh, stone walls that has moss on it, and it's so soft that it crumbles in your fingers. That's because it has calcium carbonate in it, the material of tongues, which dissolves in the natural acidity of rainwater, and so the rock is dissolving away chemically, and so it's very weak and fragile, but plants love it because it's so close to a neutral pH. And one of the ways to tell when you've got a really good soil around here is if you see this thing called um, maidenhair fern, this it's distinctive fern, and this picture doesn't really show it, but maidenhair ferns have black stems, okay? That's very distinctive. So when you see this fern, you're looking at fabulous soil. And that's because of the underwater landslides coming from western Vermont 400 million years ago that created that band of bedrock that is so rich. So here's over near the Bunker Farm. This is Waits River Formation soil. You have lots of fields. And then along the crest of the ridge, you notice there aren't many farms as you get up to the top of Putney Mountain or um, further to Windmill Hill uh, in Westminster West, and that's because there's lots of quartzite up there. The soils are thin, the trees are scrawny, and you also, up on the top of that long ridge, uh, in some places, find a layer of volcanic or igneous origin rock, this black stuff, which is called amphibolite. Right here is a piece of quartzite. And so that was yet one more component of this deep ocean 400 million years ago, all of which are now folded up and wrinkled to, de to determine the bedrock geology of eastern Wyndham County. One other thing that happened um, about 380 million years ago as part of this whole folding process was that some of this material didn't just get folded right up against North America, it got subducted, dragged way down 50 miles below the surface and then uh, generated bubbles of hot magma that came rising up towards the surface. This is a cross-sectional map of Dummerston, okay? Over here you have the Dummerston Fault. Now, I want to just emphasize that it's, it's not Dummerston's fault. It's <laughs> Dummerston's fault, okay? <laughs> it's not Dummerston's fault. Okay, so 
So Black Mountain, what is today Black Mountain, was trying to rise up through the overlying rock, which in those days was way up here, way above, like maybe 10 miles higher than where it is today, and it's eroded away in that time. But at that time, the red-hot molten rock was trying to get up here, might have made it to the surface and been a volcano. It's possible. We can't know for sure because everything's eroded away. But what's happened is that in 380 million years, the overlying rock has eroded, and the, um, when the magma cooled, it cooled into granite. Okay, it never got to the surface. And so what we see today in Dummerston is Black Mountain. Rock that originated 10 miles underground, now finally at the surface. Here you can see a road cut on Route 30 in Dummerston, where the magma had tried to go up <coughs> through these cracks, <coughs> through the surrounding so-called country rock, and had not made it to the surface. So over millions of years, it cooled. Its crystals are small, which means it cooled relatively quickly. And here, we have the granite quarry in West Dummerston. And here's the slope of Black Mountain. It's going down like this. And then you have all these sloping lines. And we know this was a quarry, a commercial quarry. And it might seem obvious. Well, gee, the quarrymen put all these lines in here for bringing out the rock. Well, it might look like that. But the answer is no. These are natural things that are called decompression fractures, OK? And decompression fractures happen because this granite, when it originally solidified, was miles underground under thousands of atmospheres of pressure. And as the overlying rock has eroded away over the many millions of years, eventually that pressure has been reduced. And so the rock then finally pops, OK? Because the pressure has been taken away. And those lines of decompression it follow the line of the surface of the land. So here the land is sloping steeply downhill, and so all these lines do it as well. If this landscape had been flat, the decompression fractures would be flat too. If you go to see the granite quarries in Barry, they have some flat land there, and the decompression, fra flat decompression <laughs> fractures are horizontal. So this is a small plant that we call colloquially a ground pine, and we find going around here, it's not truly a pine. It's something called a lycopodium, and it's the indirect ancestor of what were the first big trees, or some of the very first big trees, about, say, 375 million years ago. And there's no evidence for them right here in Wyndham County, but just, oh, 100 miles to the west in New York State, the rocks there were laid down as sedimentary rocks and have fossils of the ancestors, indirect ancestors of lycopodiums that grew to be 100 feet high. Mm -hmm. So trees started to come in around 375 million years ago. They were quite tall in upstate New York. Uh, ferns were coming. This was taken in the winter. I could have done it in the summer. But anyway, it's a fern. And there were also things called tree ferns back then. And tree ferns today are pretty rare, but you do find them in some places like Fiji. And here's a geologist from 375 million years ago. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me get this more in focus here. OK, so this is um, a composite bedrock map of New Hampshire and Vermont. There's a brand new map that's been made for the state of Vermont which is absolutely gorgeous. It's huge. It's, it's enormous map, but it, it's a beautiful map. But this is the 1961 map, and we're going to use that one today. And if you look at these two states, to generalize, the, the, the rocks get more acid, especially in the southern parts of the states. The rocks get more acid as you go to the east in New Hampshire, get less acid as you go westward across Vermont, and are, get to be quite rich, uh, neutral pH rocks as you get to the westernmost part of the state. And so there are some exceptions to that generalization. But broadly speaking, that's right. And so on the New Hampshire side around here, we find oaks doing well, because oaks do fine in acid conditions. You find mountain laurels, abundant, say, on Mount Wantasticate, 
because you have acid soils. But if you come west into Vermont, you won't find them except in a few isolated spots like Black Mountain, which has acid soil. Um, some of you may have noticed that the town of Vernon has lots of mountain laurels. That's because geologically, Vernon is part of the New Hampshire geological province because the boundary between New Hampshire acid rocks and Vermont less acid rocks doesn't exactly follow the Connecticut River. It just approximates it. And so Vernon has geology that's more New Hampshire-like and maybe some politics that are a bit more New Hampshire-like, too. <laughs> <laughs> And then over on the New Hampshire side, you'll find a lot more sand and a lot more acidity there. <coughs> on the Vermont side, the rocks are not so acid, and so our most common maple is the sugar maple, which demands a rich soil. The most common maple in New Hampshire is a red maple. It's not so particular. We have white ash. Now, it's true that Vermont and New Hampshire originally were settled by people who came from southern New England and who were all Yankees. They were ethnically very similar. They built congregational churches and everything. And the two states uh, looked like twins. But because New Hampshire soils were a bit more acid in the 19th century, agriculture failed a little sooner. In Vermont, the agriculture went on a little longer because the soils were not so bad. And so New Hampshire drifted more towards industry, which Vermont never did. And so New Hampshire, um, had low, low taxes to attract more industry. Vermont didn't care. And then after the Second World War, Massachusetts had really high taxes. So a lot of tax refugees moved into New Hampshire. And then after the six, in the 60s, a lot of lifestyle refugees moved to Vermont. And the state's politics really started to diverge. You go back 100 years ago, the state's politics were very similar. But by the 1970s, New Hampshire had become quite to the right. New Hampshire far to the left. And it was got so far um, different that they, boy, they were almost completely unlike each other. And what was controlling this? Well, if we go back to the deep ocean sediments of 400 million years ago, <laughs> we got the benefit of the Tums rocks and they never did. <laughs> and so those ancient seashells are still calling the shots politically. 400 million years later. <laughs> okay, so let's see. By about 250 million years ago, we had moved away from Brazil and we were now north of the equator. And as we got north to the of the equator, the final collision happened that affected us in terms of collisions. This was the collision of Africa coming right up against New England and the east coast of the United States. No ocean existed anymore separating Africa from North America. Instead, we were at the center of a great big continent called Pangaea. And at this point, we were in a sort of semi-arid, uh, somewhat tropical, semi-tropical environment. And there's loads of fossils from that time, 200 million years ago, down one county south of us, Franklin County, Massachusetts, um, where there's tons of evidence of what the environment was like 200 million years ago. So there's shales down there telling you there, was, there were lakes. There, this isn't too clear, but there was lots of sands and gravels in some places on Route 2 that show you that they had flash floods, as happens in tropical in, in desert environments where you it'll be pretty dry for a long time and then they'll get this terrible downpour. Huge amounts of sand and gravel um, will wash down from the hills. Why aren't there those fossils up here? Oh, because they all they've all eroded away here. In other words, basically we're a little higher in elevation and so the, anything from that era is gone for us. And but what happened in the in the Connecticut River Valley and in some other basins along the East Coast is that the rocks dropped down there, okay? And so the rocks were sort of like, like they went down into a kind of like into a, into a depression. And so because they were low, they didn't get eroded away. Whereas up here they did. 200 million years ago, there were dinosaurs. And these are dinosaur footprints right on Route 2 in Massachusetts. And we think of dinosaurs as being big, but 
in order for some dinosaurs to get big, they had to be eating other dinosaurs that weren't so big. So there, and you can put your finger, on Route 2, you can put your finger in the footstep that was made by a dinosaur 200 million years ago. And that southern Connecticut River Valley has the best fossil footprints of dinosaurs in the world. It's, it's quite good, but we don't have it right here. And there are ripple marks, and so you can infer quite a bit from the just very vivid detail that is preserved in those fossils. I mean, you can see, there's some place, I don't have a picture of it here, where you can see the raindrop splatter marks that hit a sandy surface, and they're still there from some thunderstorm 200 million years ago. Amazing. Then, around 200 million years ago, we split apart from Africa, okay? And we didn't start to split apart too quickly. And at first, there were a whole bunch of rift valleys all up and down the East Coast, of which the Lower Connecticut River Valley is one. There's the Gettysburg Basin. There's the Newark Basin, the Culpeper Basin, Basin in Virginia. Parts of the Bay of Fundy were one, one of these rift valleys that would open, start to open up, and then they, they didn't they stopped opening up, and that's what happened to the Connecticut River Valley. It started to open a little bit, and then it didn't open any further. But one of those many rift valleys never stopped rifting. It's called the Atlantic Ocean. And it's still separating from our continent at the rate of about an inch a year. And if you get your calculator out, <laughs> one inch a year for 200 million years will give you about 3,000 miles. That's what you've got there. So one inch a year means we're moving away from Europe as well, an inch a year. So I'm 63 years old. In my life, I'm, I've moved a little more than five feet away from Europe. And this has been going on for a long time. So as we moved westward, our continent started to move westward and the Atlantic began to open up. We moved over some hot spots, like Hawaii today is a hot spot and you have volcanoes. Well, we were moving over hot spots and a lot of the white mountains were created um, as we went over hot spots from 200 or around 125 million years ago or so. Um, and one of the white mountains that happens to be located in the state of Vermont is Mount Escutney, which is just across the border, but geologically has a lot more in common with some of the white mountains, though not all the white mountains are of this age. Some are older. And so 125 million years ago, Mount Escutney wouldn't have been 3,000 feet high. It would have been 15 or 20,000 feet high. It was an enormous volcano. And there were at least two huge explosions that happened and which are recorded in the bedrock visible there to geologists. And if we'd been here on the interstate highway uh, 125 million years ago during one of those explosions, we could have seen dinosaurs running down the interstate to get away. <laughs> um, the plants of the past were not the same plants as we have today. So prior to, I think, 125 million years ago, and I don't know if that date's exactly right, we did not have flowering plants. We had things more like conifers. But then around 125 million years ago, in came the flowering plant. And if we go to, we're compressing time here. If we go to about 20 million years ago, the landscape around here would have looked something like that. In other words, there's Mount Monadnock. There's a few high hills. But mostly, our land is thought by geologists to have been pretty low lying. And it would have looked kind of like that. And then within the last 20 million years, the land has been uplifted 1,000 or more feet in some places. And once the land was uplifted, valleys were eroded out by erosion. But the old summit lines are still pretty flat. This is up on top of Hogback. And if you mentally connect all these summits together, it's a pretty flat landscape. But it's the valleys that have had a chance to erode out. So our landscape here in eastern Vermont is an eroded plateau or a dissected plateau. <coughs> Five million years ago, the climate around here was like the climate of Virginia or the Carolinas today. And in a few places, you can find soil called saprolite, which is the kind of soil you find down in Virginia or the Carolinas today, sort of reddish 
uh, gray clay with no little rocks in it. Most of our rocks around, most of our soils around here have all kinds of little rocks. But this is just clay, and this is over in Harrisville, New Hampshire. Most of these ancient soils were taken away by the, by the glacier or are covered over. So you don't, it's hard to find too many of them, but you do discover a few. And then, beginning around two million years ago, snows piled up in Quebec. Now, I was up in Quebec two winters ago in March, 50 miles north of Quebec City. The snow was seven feet deep on the ground. I was told if I'd gone another 100 miles north, the, the snow was 13 feet deep on the ground in March. So it really snows up here. And beginning two million years ago, I guess it really snowed. <laughs> it snowed so much that it didn't melt during the summers. And so the snow piled up. And when snow starts piling up too high, it compresses into ice. When the ice gets thicker than 50 or 100 feet or so, ice begins to flow. And so starting two million years ago, the ice ages began. And there were at least 16 separate ice advances and retreats of which in the last two million years, of which at least four <coughs> made it down into New England. And the most recent big ice advance here reached its peak <coughs> around 18,000 years ago. So at that point, all of New England, practically except little bits of Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket, were covered with ice. It was higher than the top of Mount Washington. In other words, they found a glacial erratic that was transported from the north on top of Mount Washington. And unless the Native Americans were big practical jokers, <laughs> we, th we think the geologists have inferred that tells us that there was ice taller than Mount Washington. But the top of Mount Marcy doesn't have it in the Adirondacks. So that gives you a pretty good idea of the thickness of the ice. And Mount Marcy is 5,000 feet. This was six. It wasn't quite as deep over here. So everywhere in New England at that point, except for south, the southern part of Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket, would have been covered by ice. That means no plants, no animals, no nothing. It would have looked like Antarctica. But then beginning after 18,000 years ago, well, let's see. Let's first look. So as the ice would come down, what would happen is here the ice is flowing from right to left. The ice would come across a hill like this. It would sort of bevel the north side, but then on the south side it would pluck rocks away from the suction that was created. And so you get these cliffs forming on the south sides of hills and a less steep side on the north side. Where there were already pre-existing river valleys going pretty much north-south, the direction of the ice, such as here north of Manchester, um, the ice would get stuck in these valleys, preferentially because of the gravity, and just dig it out deeper. That's kind of what happens when you drive in your car on a muddy road in mud season, and you're trying to stay out of the ruts, right? But once your tire gets stuck in the rut, you're just going to deepen the rut even more. Well, the ice does that, did that to the north-south valleys. Here you can see a south-facing hillside that was plucked away by the ice. Sometimes the ice would stall in a given place. And when it stalled, it would melt out a bit. And especially if, if ice kept flowing from the north at the same time and was melting out, it would just start dumping huge amounts of material called a moraine, where it gets stuck. And this is a little moraine uh, in the western part of the state. But big moraines would be basically Cape Cod was a moraine, or at least the outwash of a moraine. Uh, Long Island was a moraine, or two moraines. <coughs> Another thing that would happen, as the ice finally melted, it contained within it all kinds of boulders, rocks, sands, gravels, clay, higgledy-piggledy picked up. And it would just drop them, at, or in effect drop them, as the ice melted away. And this is called a glacial erratic. And this is one uh, made out of black mountain granite, which is quite distinct around here, because it's the only granite of that type uh, only source of granite around here of that type is Black Mountain. And so all over West Brattleboro in the southern part of Dummerston, you see tons of these um, glacial erratics that came from, identifiably came from <coughs> Black Mountain. Another mountain to the north of us, Escutney, has a very distinctive kind of granite <coughs> called cyanite, 
and because it's so distinctive, geologists can trace it all the way down through southern New England and know the direction of the flow of the ice by where those boulders were dropped. This is a snowbank in March. This is not a glacier, but the glacier, as it would melt down, was on a macro scale, something similar to what happens on a micro scale with a snowbank. Think back to February when the snowbank was four feet high. It had this gravel in it, but it was much more diffuse because there was plenty of snow. As the snow melts down, the gravel doesn't go away. And finally, the gravel just gets deposited in this mess, in this sort of chaotic jumble. Um, and on a much bigger scale, that was happening as the material stayed behind when the ice melted from the glacier. And so we find what's called glacial till, which will often have a higgledy-piggledy variety of different rocks in it with no obvious sorting or um, arrangement. It's just chaotic. Look at this. Why was New England farming abandoned? <laughs> and especially, and this is over on the New Hampshire side. So why did they vote for Bush? Well, you know. <laughs> Okay, as the, as the glacier traveled, it carried embedded within it all kinds of rocks and sands and gravels. Imagine you have a, a, a pint of ice cream and you take the top off and you go out to your driveway and you drag that ice cream upside down go across the driveway. It's going to pick up all these rocks. Well, if there happens, that's basically what I, the ice did, except there's a, a mile's worth of weight of ice on top. And so it would polish and scratch bedrock. Here you can see more scratches. In some places, when the ice finally melted, the glacial till was very thin on the ground. So here you can see, this is up on Putney Mountain. It didn't leave much material. The bedrock is very close to the surface. At another location up on Putney Mountain, maybe a mile or two away, the till's eight feet thick. So it's very haphazard and higgledy-piggledy. Another uh, creation of the uh, glacier were these hills called drumlins. And Dummerston is loaded with drumlins. This one's down um, on Black Mountain Road, slightly in Brattleboro. But drumlins are these hills that sort of, sort of look like they're egg-shaped, if you could see them from above. And so they have this egg shape like this. And the long axis of the egg is the same as the direction of the flow of the ice. So you can infer what direction the ice was flowing in from the angles of the drumlin. And here's a drumlin map of New Hampshire. You can see they come in swarms, OK? And Boston has drumlins. Beacon Hill is a drumlin. Bunker Hill is a drumlin. And if you take off from Logan Airport, all those islands in Boston Harbor, they're all drumlins that have been flooded by sea level rise because when the glacier was at its peak 18,000 years ago. So much of the world's water was lo locked up in the ice of these continental ice sheets that the sea level worldwide dropped as much as 400 feet all over the world. And then as the ice melted, that um, sea level has risen and flooded a lot of the sea coasts. And if we, with global warming, were to flood Antarct were to melt Antarctica and Greenland, the additional sea level rise would be something like 220 feet. Okay? And 220 feet happens to be the level of the water in the Connecticut River. So <laughs> if if we it's not gonna happen anytime soon, but if we totally flooded Antarctica oceanfront property. Ocean property right here. <laughs> you know. So I know the Normandos and the real estate get, get ready for a boom, <laughs> especially with global warming. I mean, this could be a tropical destination. OK, so the, the ice, as it melted back, it didn't melt back all at once. And so at one point, it stalled coming back in the, in the river valley. And because it was stuck there for a while, it created something called the Dummerston Moraine. Okay, so the easternmost part of Dummerston there, with all those sand and gravel pits, that's the Dummerston Moraine that was created by the ice as it was retreating. 
Another thing that the ice created as it was retreating was a huge lake, a lake that extended from south of Hartford, Connecticut, eventually all the way up to St. Johnsbury. This was called Glacial Lake Hitchcock. And in our area, it would have covered the, the Connecticut River Valley like this. It would have flooded most of downtown Brattleboro. Part of it went up the West River all the way up to like Newfane and Townsend. And then the main part of Glacial Lake Hitchcock continued up the Connecticut River Valley. So much of Dummerston would have been a peninsula at that time. Here, in looking at Brattleboro from Mount Wantastic, everything below this line, the level of the parking lot <coughs> at the Brattleboro Memorial Hospital, everything below that line would have been underwater. So the co-op, you'd need to snorkel to go there, <laughs> right? The latches, forget it, you know, you need a submarine. <laughs> Everything below the top of this cupola would have been underwater. The cupola might have stuck up sort of like a buoy. <laughs> here, looking at Wantasticate, the line was about here. So if you're looking across the Connecticut River, this, this, is, this would have been below the level. Above here would have been dry land. What's the evidence of that? Oh, well, here you don't have direct evidence on Wantasticate because it's bare bedrock. But what you do have is in other places where the depo shoreline deposits were, you know the elevation of the shoreline deposits, you know the lake was basically flat, okay? So you can then project to the elevation across here. Now, one of the things about Glacial Lake Hitchcock that's kind of interesting is it was, there was a moraine south of Hartford, Connecticut that dammed up the Connecticut River and is what created this long lake that go, went all the way up to St. Johnsbury eventually. But if you think about it, hold it. Hartford's maybe 100 feet above <coughs> sea level or something. St. Johnsbury's, Johnsbury's something like 600 feet or 700 feet. There's no evidence for a dam south of Hartford that's 600 feet high. That, there's no evidence of that. That didn't exist. Instead, what happened was the only reason the lake could happen as a lake is because the, uh, the ice still existed to the north. It did not exist to the south. And the weight of the ice to the north depressed the land so much that the Connecticut River Valley, instead of sloping downhill to the south the way it does today, was flat. And so that's how the lake could exist. But as the ice continued to retreat to the north, the land rebounded, the lake drained, and the Connecticut River Valley um, reemerged as a river valley and not as a lake, although for a while it was a string of lakes. But eventually, it was a, it was a river valley again. And so the weight of the ice flattened out the land so much to permit that lake to happen. Roger, what would have been the Oh, and let's see. Um, well, first of all, the, the parking area of the Bravo Memorial Hospital, the, that whole terrace, ser series of terraces in Brattleboro that's the same elevation as that uh, uh, parking lot, of which there are quite a few. And then geologists have kept track of, of the slope of all of these terraces as you go up the Connecticut River Valley. And they lose, I think it's, oh, I can't remember the exact ratio. I think it's like four feet to the mile. They slope slightly upward today, whereas then they had to be flat. You see what I'm saying? So everything, so these shoreline deposits that should be absolutely flat if the lake was existing today, they slightly slope up the whole way. So this is Bellows Falls. and. Well, I guess whoever laid out Bellows Falls was not anticipating Glacial Lake Hitchcock to return because basically they put all the houses <laughs> exactly where they would have gotten flooded. So this whole area would have been flooded out. Here is an example of a shoreline deposit. This is the delta of, is it, is it the Cold River? I can't remember the name of the river. Yeah, in Walpole, North Walpole. So that would have been its snout would have been the shoreline there. So everything below that would have been underwater. Here, again, these are, this is Bald Hill looking south in the Bellows Falls area. This whole flat area here would have been shoreline deposits. There were huge amounts of sediment that were coming down as the ice was melting out, lots of sand and gravel. 
And where you have sandy soils, you're going to have lots of pines. And one of the things that the, this lake has created is a lot of what are called vars. And this is a sand and gravel pit. And you'll notice these lines here. What they represent is they represent deposits created in the clay, the bottom clay, of Glacial Lake Hitchcock with the thicker light colored deposits happening during the summer months when the surface of the water is liquid, there's lots of sediment coming in, a lot gets deposited, and then during the winter months, the lake would freeze over, it was very still, and the very fine sediments, the dark layers, would settle down. And so what you create is a couplet. Each year, you get a winter, and then you get a summer, winter and summer. And so you can count these couplets like tree rings and tell how long the lake was there. Here we have Bellows Falls, seen from Fall Mountain. And if you notice, look at these terraces. You've got one terrace here, another there, another there, another there, another there, another there. And then finally you get down to bedrock. What's the story? Well, when Glacial Lake Hitchcock was here, it deposited lots of muds and clays at its bottom. And then the lake drained. And once the lake drained, the Connecticut River came back and was flowing through the glacial lake deposits. And then every once in a while, you get a terrible hurricane like Irene or some other huge flood. And what would happen is the Connecticut River would go into a, you know, in a crazy flood, erode away a huge amount of one of these terraces to have a new floodplain level, OK? And then you'd wait another couple of centuries or whatever, and then you'd have another hurricane that would do the same thing and lower the floodplain again, and then another one, down again, and another, and another until finally the river got to bedrock. And when it gets to bedrock, it can't erode anymore. But what is left behind is a sort of stair step of these terraces climbing up the valley. And you find this all up and down the Connecticut River Valley. So here you can see them. One, two, this bing, bing, bing. And we have it in Brattleboro. And so Brattleboro has a bunch of terraces. And then you have to build these steep little roads to connect them. So that's the story of Brattleboro's street layout, is everything's pretty flat in some places, and then suddenly you're dropping down. Here you can see we've got one terrace here, another terrace. How do we get there? I mean, this car's trying to figure it out. God, how do you do it? <laughs> and these finally found a little road. <laughs> so that takes us up to the present. We've come 450 million years, but I know we like to think forwards into the future. And so where might we be going geologically in the future? Well, what's that doing? <laughs> this is, that's my knee poking through the blue jeans. Well, what's that got to do with geology? Well, let's see. I think if we, if we play Sherlock Holmes here, we can figure out once upon a time, this blue jean was continuous, and then the knee sort of burst its way through, OK? We can figure that out. Well, here's a bedrock map of New England and eastern New York State. And these are the Adirondack Mountains here. This is the state of Vermont, OK? New Hampshire's over there. Lake Ontario. And this, this brownish, greenish stuff, this is the Adirondack surrounded by pink bedrock. Well, here's my knee surrounded by blue jeans that used to cover my knee. This pink bedrock used to cover the Adirondacks. But the Adirondacks are bursting through because even though the Adirondacks are very old rock, they're more than a billion years old as, as rocks, but as mountains. This is a young mountain range. And geologists theorize that there is a hot spot underneath the Adirondacks pushing them up because the Adirondacks have been measured to be rising faster than the Swiss Alps today. So yeah. So I don't know what's going to happen in a million years. I mean, but it looks like we might possibly have a high mountain range to our west. Who knows? But that's what's going on there. So there we have 450 million years of Wyndham County geology and a little preview into the future. <laughs> Uh, 
I'll take questions. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Isn't there a place over along the West River where you can see those terraces in Dunstan? There probably is. I mean, yes, I'm sure. They're, they're all over the place on both the West River and on the Connecticut River. Any of these river valleys that had what are called proglacial lakes all went through the same process. And there is today one proglacial lake that hasn't quite uh, um, drained in the northwestern part of Vermont. It's called Lake Champlain. That is a proglacial lake. That it, the glacier part is gone, but it was it's a creation of the glacier. And one reason it hasn't disappeared is that the, because it's flowing north, the land has been rebounding to the north, blocking it from draining. So. But in a sense, that was sort of a, a twin of Glacial Lake Hitchcock. But I remember being on a walk with you, and you said, this used to be a beach. Oh, way, oh yes, on Black Mountain. Yes, there's, yes. If you go up the Nature Conservancy Trail from the West River, you can see a series of terraces there which have a similar chronology. It's a little more complicated than the one I gave here, but it, it's the same idea. And you would find these all over the place. Yes. Yep. Oh, uh, north of the, um, sorry, Manchester, yeah. they mine talcum. And uh, so where does that come from? Well, let's see. That is a different kind of deposit than the one I got into with the, with the tongs. Okay, so that's for your feet, not for your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> and um, the talc, most of the talc that's mined in Vermont comes from these kinds of rocks which are called ultra mafic rocks. And these are rocks that as part of these, con these collision processes that happen come from deep in the mantle of the earth, deep down, and, but they get dragged along and become a part of our green mountains. And so there are a series of serpentine and soapstone and talc and asbestos, they're all related. And there's a bunch of them that if I they're just little dot. I put little dots here on the map. Or I guess they're down like this. Oh, here they are. Okay, they're showing some of them. These are little green ones. And so their origins are from deep in the mantle. And so that's that's where that comes from. So it's quite different than than these other ones. Yes. How about this? <coughs> excuse me. How about the slate for? across the road and down through Vernon and Guilford, and I understand north of here as well. Well, they were deep ocean sediments and started as muds and clays and were not cooked quite <coughs> as far as the phyllites were cooked, okay, which is why they had that nice cleavage. And so that's where the slates happen. So basically, if you start out with mud, it turn, if you compress it far enough, it turns into shale. You take shale and compress it further, it turns into slate, okay? Compress the slate further, you'll get to phyllite. Compress the phyllite further, you get to schist. Compress the schist far enough to gneiss, which is a, a rock, and then compress the gneiss far enough, it gets all the way back to gray, <coughs> compress and cook. And so slate is like the least compressed of the mud rocks that have been metamorphosed. So, and then there's a big slate belt in the western part of the state of Vermont, right on the New York border. Similar rocks that didn't get compressed too terribly far to make good roofing material. Yeah. Can you just explain what you mean? <coughs> oh, okay. If you go down into the earth, it gets hotter, right? Yeah. And so when these rocks were buried miles underground, they were all much hotter than they are now. Okay? You can think of the surface of the Earth as sort of being like the surface of your body if you go out in the wintertime, right? You're 98.6 in here, but it's below zero out here. And, but right along the surface, it's, it's something in between. And so the planet, because it's hot from the natural radioactive decay, as you go further down, it gets cold. Anything below. Good question. Yep? Uh, could you explain again how uh, the uh, formation of Long Island and Cape Cod. Okay. I, I just didn't okay. understand. Well, we, we, before the glacier came, we had soils here that were much thicker than they are now. Okay? Like Virginia. Go to Virginia. You've got a lot of soils. The glacier came down, basically took anything that was loose, and either incorporated, incorporated it into the ice, and, and, and it's sort of like a conveyor belt of ice that gets down to 
say, Cape Cod and Long Island, and as it melts at, at, at its edge, it's dumping all this material, which is creating a bigger and bigger hill, which keeps, or moraine, which keeps the ice stalled there even further, and keeps melting more, and creates these linear hills, and which, one of which is Cape Cod, because the lobe of the ice was like this, and so it was like that. And Long Island has two moraines, because they were two separate ice advances. One went a little further than the other. And so when you go to Cape Cod and they charge you at the motel to stay there, they're charging you to stay on our land. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so much material was brought down by the ice and deposited down there that to drill down to bedrock on Nantucket, it's 1,500 feet before you hit bedrock on Nantucket. Yes. So that's a lot of material. Yes. Roger, could you recapitulate which tectonic events were responsible for the greens? I understand that the conics are the previous ones. Right. The, the greens are the second. Okay. The, the, the conics are 450 million years ago, and they're here. And they, by the way, continue all the way up to the Gaspé Peninsula <coughs> intermittently. Then, we had a second collision called the Acadian orogeny 400 million years ago. And it, it is represented by the rocks here in the northern Green Mountains but in the, and our rocks in the eastern part of the state. But in the southern Green Mountains, whatever may have been on top of those rocks has eroded away so that the southern Green Mountains are of Adirondack age. Okay, so Stratton and Glastonbury Mountain. Now, there's an exception. Mount Snow is a taconic that happens to have gotten, that was straggling and didn't make it all the way to Manchester. We wanted, wanted to go shopping, but just never made it. So it got stuck. So it's a taconic that's on top of, so these are billion year old rocks. And then the uh, Mount Snow is a taconic that's 450 million years old, stuck on it. <coughs> okay, the final thing. What was the taconic process that produced this big plutonic event that is in here? Oh, okay. It's let's see. New Hampshire's story is a little more, a little different than ours because they have lots of granites and we don't have that much. So they got. Let's see. Here's Avalonia, and then there were on these another terrain, and then it's so-called terrain. Avalonia is over here. Avalonia is here. No, oh, Avalonia. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> All right, so here's half a load of it. And New Hampshire has much the same age rocks as we have, and the core, but some of the green mountains, some of the white mountains are about the same age as our rocks here, 400 million years old. Like the top of Mount Washington is about the same age as our rocks right here in Eastern Union County. But another thing that happened to create the white mountains that we didn't get much of is that is the hot spot that we rode over. Um, something like 150, 125 million years ago, and that's all this green rock. See all this stuff? We don't, see, we just have a scutney. I don't even think a scutney, you know, there's a scutney, but they have tons of that. And a little bit of the Northeast Kingdom maybe got some of that. But that's, that's the line of, those, of that hot spot there. Mm -hmm. So they, they got something we, we got a little bit of. Yes? Is marble created by a hot spot, or, or can you talk about marble? Well, marble is basically, if you take limestone, okay, chemically, marble, limestone, and tongues are all the same. I think they put a little sweetener in tongues, but other than that, and seashells and coral. So marble is what happens when you cook it enough so it crystallizes. So it's crystallized limestone. So that's what it is. But chemically, they're the same. Yes? Can you uh, give any theory why Black Mountain is horseshoe shaped? Yes. Um, it is common for granite mountains to either be circular or semi-circular. And geologists aren't quite sure exactly why, because those processes, if they're happening today, are happening miles underground. But what may have happened is it may have been that maybe the magma may have originally been a big blob like this, but the hottest stuff may have exploded upwards and left behind a cavity. Maybe that's an explanation. You know, no, we can't exactly know, but it's pretty common to have circular 
granite mountains. I don't know if you can see from that distance, but Ossipee Mountain in New Hampshire is circular, and it's granite. Would, would Black Mountain have also been plucked? With the yes, it's been plucked by the glaciers, too. So it's got south, steep south-facing um, cliffs, yes. Yep. Explain the drumlin again, please. Oh, a drumlin is a hill that's <coughs> created by glacial deposits, and geologists aren't entirely certain why they happen because the they can't on Antarctica and Greenland today they can't see it happening there. But what they think it is is the glaciers didn't simply advance and then retreat in a big single move. They were doing this, you know, like that. And so it's thought that drumlins are reworked previous glacial deposits, that, it, that the glacier then went over a second time and has sort of smoothed it out. But there's still some uncertainty as to how drumlins happen. Yes? Uh, I have a lot of quartz on my farm, ranging from little pieces to boulder uh, quartz. What, what is quartz and where do they come from and why, why do I have them up on well, my elevation? Well, let's see. Quartz is the most common rock. Uh, um, well, it's common sing single mineral, anyway. Um, and so the origins, of course, can be very variable. Um, so it's hard to say exactly where yours came from. Um, but a possibility, is, is it white in color? Some of them are white, some of them are translucent. Are translucent. OK. Um, well, it's possible that these were originally sand deposits. I don't know exactly where you live. Westminster West. Westminster West. So it's probably originally sand, it could be sand deposits that had been uh, on the bottom of the ocean. And then as they got cooked, they would have turned from sand to sandstone to quartzite. And that may be the explanation. Quartz is so common and so abundant. It can come in any number of forms and origins. But you don't see, you don't see like huge deposits of the a singular quartz. So did it get bought down? Oh, then it was right. If it was just loose, then it, right. you're brought down by the glacier. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I live over in West Berlin. Yes. And there's a, a ridge behind us, and there's a fluorite mine there. Mm -hmm. It's the green. And then there's another area that has the purple, as well as the clear. And so fluorite would have come from that green quartz. Right, you know, I don't know the New Hampshire, I'm sorry to say, it's okay. I stay on the Vermont <laughs> side, so I don't know all the details <laughs> on the New Hampshire <laughs> side, you know, <laughs> except that they experienced, you know, the same foldings that we went sure. through, um, but the... Where is the ridge behind? You know where the Exxon station, I think it is, up there, is it Exxon or Right. So no, well, that one, and there's that little radio tower, and, uh, Yep. It's it's that ridge, and on the okay. other side, that's where it is. Yeah, and I just I just don't know. I wish I could, I wish I could answer. That. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. A man said they should make the earth when you're going along and totally blocks the sun of getting to the moon. So when it's turning, it cannot it cannot get it cannot get it cannot get to it. Eclipse. Oh yes. Yeah. Some, every so often you'll get an eclipse. And let's see that if the moon's orbit was in exactly the same plane as the as the Earth's orbit around the sun and everything, we'd get eclipses all the time. But I think the moon is just enough off from being in the same plane as the Earth. Yeah. So we get eclipses occasionally, but not all the time. Yeah. Also, the moon's distance from the Earth is not always the same, so it varies a bit. Mm -hmm. So the moon is not always the same size, apparent size in the sky. So sometimes it's a little brighter, sometimes a little less. I may, I may be misunderstanding what she's talking about, but we had a, a, a phenomenal eclipse a couple of days ago. Oh, OK. And that may be what she OK, well, I guess I, my, I was eclipsed. I didn't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, thank you. Yes. <laughs> Uh, you've spoken about how, around 5 million years ago, 
climate here is similar to what it now is in Virginia. And after that, there was quite a long time when clearly we were beyond an Arctic climate here because we were under thousands of feet of ice. About 18,000 years ago, it began to retreat. I happen to know that in northern Quebec, it was, it was still there about 5,000 years ago. It used to work up there. Um, and the sea level was down 400 feet, and the sea level is now rising. And of course, it's still rising now, and we're supposed to be worrying about the sea level is rising, and the climate is warming. Now, has it, has it actually been doing that for thousands of years already, for reasons that have nothing to do with humans? Yes, it was, well, basically the climate warmed after the ice retreated, and reached a, a climate temperature maximum about 6,000 years ago, and for the last 6,000 years it's been unevenly sort of cooling a bit, not drastically, but cooling. And then now suddenly it's warming again. The real difference between what we're doing and what happened after the retreat of the ice is the speed with which the climate is warming now. It's much faster than as what happened before. And so that's what's really the big difference. To give a little perspective, compared to the last 2 million years, the climate we have right now, even though we say it's global warming and everything, um, is, is unusually warm, right? Uh, but if we go back over the last 500 million years, the climate worldwide has generally been warmer than it is right now. So it's been unusual that in the last 2 million years there's been these big ice advances and retreats. Um, just the existence of Greenland and Antarctica with big ice sheets on them now. This is pretty unusual in the last history of the Earth, the last 500 million years. So we're still in a comparatively cool time compared to most of the last 500 million years. But we're in a very warm time compared to the last 2 million years. Any other questions? Thank you.